Hey everyone, uh, doing another video here, and um, this one here it's a an article that I wrote on the Book of Revelation on the on the first few chapters there, um, looking at the seven churches um, that are mentioned. I think in in chapters two and three. Um, I wrote this back on uh, June tenth, two thousand fifteen. <clears throat> And I titled it, um, Lessons Learned from the Seven Churches of Revelation. And the idea here is that each of these churches um, can give us uh, uh, exhortation on, on, on our current lives. We, we can look at, at what they were praised for and what they were criticized for and apply that to our, our um, current life, our, our current church life, our walk with Christ. And so um, this one here, it's, it's kind of lengthy. Um, but I'm going to try to get through it all in one video. I, I don't want to have to divide it up into two. Um, if it, if it gets too long, I'll have no choice but to, to divide it up. But I, I think I should be able to get through it all. Um, as always, if you can't watch the whole thing, um, you can only catch a little bit. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, you can watch this and all my videos at your convenience. Uh, it's King Ram 417 That's K, my middle initial. Ingram, my last name, 417, King Ram 417. And I try to get these posted as soon as I'm done going live, um, so you'll have access to it uh, pretty quick, uh, Lord willing. And um, before jumping in, I pray. Um, so if you guys want to pray with me, I'd appreciate it. Oh, Lord. I ask that you forgive me of my sins, my presumptuous sins, Lord. My habitual sins that I, I just, like an ox led to the slaughter, I just keep going back to them, Lord. There's not enough fear of you before my eyes, Lord, to, to stop me. And it's, You said that uh, by, by the fear of you, men depart from iniquity. And so I, I pray that you would please grant me that godly fear, Lord, and, and sorrow over my sins, that I would, I would have true repentance, Lord, that you would break the grip that I have on my sin, that, that you, would, you would cause me to release it, Lord, and grant me victory over my sins, please, Lord. Reading in... Uh, 2 Timothy 3, about the qualifications of a, of a bishop and an elder or a deacon. Lord, how that, that should be the standard of holiness for all godly men. And, and how far short of that I am, Lord. How, how I fail in so many different areas, Lord. That In all my years of being with you, I still seem so far from holiness, Lord. Pray that you continue to work in me, that you continue to sanctify me, Lord. Please don't stop your work, Lord. Please draw me ever nearer unto you. Bring me further up the mountain, Lord. Purify my heart. Get rid of my pride, my lust, my all my sins, Lord. My anger, my bitterness, my whatever sins lurk in my heart, Lord. The pride of life, the the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh, as your word says. Forgive me, Lord. Make me worthy of, of speaking about your word. Make me worthy um, to come and talk to others about you, to talk to others about your glorious word, Lord. Make me worthy, Lord. Help me to, to step aside and, and to glorify you, Lord. Let your words ring true. Um, let your glory be magnified in spite of me, Lord. Help me to lift my eyes to you and to make much of you um, in this video and, and in everything I do, Lord. I pray for your guidance. I pray for spiritual years, Lord. I pray that whatever's good, whatever's true, um, whatever's holy and, and righteous and accurate, in this article, Lord, I pray that it would just stick with us, that, that it would um, glorify you in our hearts, that we would magnify you, that we would be drawn unto you, that it would conform us to your image, that it would change us, Lord. 
And anything that's uh, in error or anything that's from me and uh, a mistake, Lord, I pray that it just go in one ear and out the other and that, that you, you correct my thinking wherever I'm wrong, Lord. Just glorify yourself in this. Be with me, Lord. I love you, Lord. And, and give me the endurance, Lord. This is a lengthy one. Help keep me awake and uh, alert as I go through this. In Jesus' name I pray. I love you, Lord. Amen. <clears throat> All right, so like I mentioned, this is called uh, Lessons Learned from the Seven Churches of Revelation. Um, so church number one is the church at Ephesus, uh, which is talked about in Revelation 2, uh, verses 2 through 6. It says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So here's the lesson. Don't forget to share the gospel. Um, th this church is commended uh, for their endurance, an effort at exposing and reviling false teachers. Um, the Lord praises them for that. They didn't just believe what was presented to them. Uh, they tested or, or tried those who claimed to be teachers. And this reminds us of the Bereans in the, in the book of Acts, who were called noble uh, for testing the teachings of Paul. They didn't even trust Paul. They, they tested what Paul was saying by the light of the scriptures um, to see if what he was saying was true. Uh, we read about that in Acts 17.11. It says, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. So, this church appears to be doing that same exact thing. Um, they're examining their teachers um, to see what is true and rejecting what is false. In other words, uh, they were diligently uh, making sure that they had sound doctrine, a sound foundation in, in firm biblical doctrine. They didn't just want to believe what was being told them. Uh, they wanted to make sure that it was scriptural. Um, and we read about um, how that's biblical in like Titus 2, 1. It says, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. And uh, 2 Timothy 2, 15, which says, study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. <clears throat> so that's what we have here in this church. They're, they're rightly dividing the word of God. They're studying to show themselves approved. Uh, they're testing the teachings of, of everybody who comes through saying that they're a teacher of the gospel. They're testing these things by the scriptures to see whether or not they're true. <clears throat> and, and those are commendable. Those are good things. However, in doing this, uh, the church had forgotten their first love. While the verses here don't necessarily confirm what that first love is, um, it seems appropriate to me to assume uh, that this is evangelism. And here's why. Um, the moment an individual get, is gloriously saved, the moment you come out of darkness into the light, the moment you're born again, uh, the first thing on your heart, I think, um, is to tell others. You want to tell other people about this experience that you've had. We burn with a zealousness to share Jesus Christ with the world. Um, for we've the secret of the universe, and it's magnificently beautiful. How could we not want to tell others? How could we not want to share him? And, and so I think that's the first love that we have, the love for Jesus Christ and the desire to share him with others. So in this church's zeal for correct doctrine, they had forgotten to share the gospel message with others. And, and this seems appropriate. Um, it's experiential in my own life. Um, I've fallen in love 
with deep doctrine. I love to study the Word of God uh, the, with the teachings of Jesus Christ. I, I love them. And, and while pursuing that so hotly, I tend to forget about evangelism. And I, I would think, based off of these verses and my own experience, that diligent study of doctrine can lead to a cooling of the zeal for evangelism. Now, the solution to this problem is given in verse 5, remembering from where we have fallen. Um, we examine our previous condition and remember the path of hell that we were on. By doing this, the glorious magnificence of salvation will continually renew our zeal for the lost. As we think about from where we fell, where we once were, as we remember that, and remember how God has saved us, it's going to continually uh, uh, fan those flames um, uh, of a zeal to tell other people. Um, so we, we have to have that balance. We, and, and that's what the, the uh, exhortation of this church is. It, is. it is good, it is commendable, it is noble that you're studying teachings to see whether or not they're true. You're testing them by the light. While doing that, don't forget um, the zeal to reach others with the gospel. Th those two things must be combined. Um, so church number two was the church at... Um, and you'll forgive me, I'm horrible with pronouncing names and places. Um, I don't take the time to figure out how it's really pronounced because it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter how a city's pronounced or a name's pronounced. I just pronounce it how I want to pronounce it. So this one here, it's, it's the church at Smyrna, I think. Um, which is talked about in Revelation 2, uh, verses 9 through 10. It says, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. So here's the lesson we learned from this church. So in the first church, the, 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 the lesson is don't forget to share the gospel. The lesson for Smyrna is endure hardships and persecutions. So this church is exhorted that although their tribulation and material poverty are recognized, they're told they're rich. And, and we read about things like that in uh, Colossians 2.3 in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In, in Jesus Christ, we have all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Excuse me. Uh, Ephesians 3.8. Um, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So we have these, these unsearchable riches uh, when we're born again. And Revelation 5.10 um, and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we on the earth. So we have unsearchable treasures and we're made unto God kings and priests. We have a high holy calling and we're given um, all the treasures of God. We're, we're given all the treasures in Christ in heavenly places. And so this church, although they're materialistically poor and persecuted, they have these riches. And, and so um, they're exhorted with that. Um, we have, and so it is with us. We have an inheritance in the heavens that are beyond imagination. And so this church also had to endure um, fake Jews um, who are really agents of Satan, subtle workers of iniquity who have slithered in among them. And, and the scriptures warned us about deal with these kinds of false teachers, false prophets. Um, 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 14, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. We're told that the devil is going to come as a preacher. He's going to come as an agent of righteousness, pretending to be a Christian. Uh, and specifically to be a teacher, to be a minister, um, an apostle even. In Jude 4, we're also told, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, 
the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So we were warned ahead of time that we would deal with stuff like this. And this church here at Smyrna is de dealing with that. They've got these false teachers amongst them. But the church is encouraged to not fear as we are. Uh, 2 Timothy 1.7 For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Um, so they're told not to fear, but to endure um, these hardships and sufferings. And the scriptures are full of, of that, telling us to do the same thing. Um, 2 Timothy 3.12 Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Um, 2 Timothy 2.3 Thou therefore endure hardships as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Um, 2 Timothy 4, 5. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist to make full proof of thy ministry. And uh, James 1, uh, 2 through 5, I, I think are, are uh, probably the key verses on, on endurance. My brethren, count it all joy when, when ye fall into divers temptations knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him. So this church is experiencing this persecution, and they're told, don't fear and endure these hardships. Don't be afraid. Endure. Some of you are going to die. Some of you are going to be cast into prisons, but you have unsearchable riches. You, even though you have an eternal inheritance, remember that. Remember who you are. Remember your calling. Um, so although they're told that they will suffer, and, and we're told that as well, they should be remembering the promises of God about endurance and about the riches we have in heavenly places and how James told us to count it all joy. Um, for God is at work through these persecutions producing holiness in us. Um, so, so that's our takeaway from this church is endure hardships and persecutions. And, and even like James says, to rejoice in them, knowing they're producing godliness and holiness in us. Uh, church number three uh, is the church at Pergamos, uh, which we read about in uh, Revelation 2, 13 through 16. It says, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed for fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. All right, so uh, lesson number one was uh, don't forget to share the gospel. Lesson number two is endure hardships and persecutions. And then the lesson here from Pergamos is, excuse me, don't passively tolerate false teaching. So this church was situated in a place where Satan's seat was. Um, so the, to me, that's saying they must have been surrounded by false teaching. They were like in the in the in the in the heart of false teaching, um, but they did not deny the faith. They stayed strong. They they kept believing in Christ, and they were not ashamed to be called by His name. Um, and Luke nine twenty six encourages us to do the same thing. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed glory and in his fathers and of the holy angels <clears throat> so they stood fast in their faith in the face of this adversary even though they're in a, in this in this uh pit of false teaching surrounded by it they stayed fast to christ they stood fast they were not ashamed of his name however it appears that they passively 
tolerated false teaching. They didn't speak out against it, uh, both that of Balaam and of the Nicolaitans. It, it could be that they, they felt so pressured to deny the name of Christ that they feared ruffling any more feathers. So they just sat back as false teaching was proclaimed. They kind of adopted a, we will be Christians, we will stand for Christ, but let everybody else believe what they want to believe. Um, and, and this makes sense to me because it, it is very hard um, to take a public stance in the face of adversity and then to pile on more attacks um, that can certainly wear you out. Um, however, they're told to repent of this or God will come and battle the false teachers with his word, um, the sword of his mouth. Uh, we read about that in Revelation 116. And he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth when a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Uh, we also read in Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, uh, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of thoughts, of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And uh, Ephesians 6, uh, verse 17, And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Um, so when, when it says the Lord will come um, with the sword of his mouth, I'm, th um, I'm saying that's, that's the Lord saying, I will come with my word. Um, so I, I believe what God is reminding us here is, you take the sword of the Spirit, the word of God, and do battle against these false teachings, or I will. And if he comes, you know, judgment begins at the house of God. So we're not to grow weary in doing good. Um, Galatians 6, 9 teaches us that. It says, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. We can't faint. We have to endure. We're going to face false teaching. We can't be content just to have a personal, private um, Christianity, to, to have our own personal private faith. We have to share that. And part of sharing that is counteracting false teaching. It, it's resisting uh, the advances of darkness. It's standing against um, false prophets, false, false apostles. Um, so we are to continually proclaim the truth in opposition to the false. And so this church was failing to do that, and that's why they were rebuked. Um, so that's our lesson takeaway there is to not passively tolerate um, false teaching. Um, church number four is the church at Thyatira. So that's uh, spoken of in Revelation 2, 19 through 25. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you, I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. So the lesson, the lesson here is to guard ourselves against seduction. So here we find a church that, that is very active in, in ministry. Uh, they strive to do good works of service and love, of faith and patience. They seem to be a church that's filled with a love for their neighbors, um, or at least loving services towards their neighbors. But in their service, they seem to have forgotten to guard themselves from seducing spirits and seductive messages, uh, which we were warned about from the very beginning. 
the seductive message. In Genesis 3, uh, 1 through 6, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. The tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So there we see the seduction uh, of the spirit of Satan, uh, seducing Eve um, with the, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life, wanting these things, wanting the wisdom, wanting to be God. And, and so that seductive spirit is at work in this church, and they're tolerating it. They're allowing it. They're focused on their services, but allowing false teaching to creep in, allowing seduction to creep in. And First Timothy 4 also warned us in uh, verse 1, it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Um, so God will eventually destroy the seducer and her children, um, those that have bought into her teaching. Uh, the mother is like the, the teacher, and then the children would be those being taught. And, and so the Lord exhorts those who have not fallen for her teaching to hold fast. So this church reminds me of like a charismatic church um, who's doing much good in their community. Uh, perhaps focused on feeding the poor and feeding the hungry and, and taking care of widows and orphans, doing good things. Uh, but they're lackadaisical in their doctrine. They're not holding firm, sound doctrine, but are wrapped up in their good deeds. Um, you'll hear a, a, lo a lot of times where doctor, or you might, might not hear it spoken, but it's evidenced in, in when you look at the church that doctrine is forsaken and it's more on, on social issues and more outreach. And, and in doing so, you're allowing false teaching to creep in. Again, there has to be that balance. We have to have the sound doctrine, the zeal to reach out to others, and the, the love and compassion to, to help others. There, one can't be forsaken for the other, and one can't outbalance the other. They're, they all have to combine in one. Um, but this church has failed to do that. They failed to hold fast that sound doctrine. So in so doing, they've allowed seducers to creep in. So the caution here is that while we, we certainly should be about our Father's business, out to our communities in love, we must also anchor that with sound biblical doctrine. And we must guard our hearts against seducers. Um, like the previous church, we must speak out against false teaching. Um, so just to recap here in these first We've, our, our lessons are to, to sh not forget to share the gospel, to endure hardships and persecution, um, to not passively uh, tolerate false teaching, but to proclaim the truth, and to, to guard against seduction, not just be focused on works and, and good deeds, but to have the balance uh, uh, of sound biblical truth. Um, so now, church number five is the church at Sardis. Uh, which we read about here in Revelation 3, uh, verses 1 through 4. It says, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy work, and that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful, and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and if therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, but they are worthy. So 
so the lesson here is a warning against dead religiosity. Um, the first thing we notice about this church is that they have a name. Um, this seems to imply that they're well known, a big public church, but they're dead. They are cautioned to take the few things remaining, but those things are even in the process of dying. Um, that's what the, the script, they're ready to die. But they're cautioned to take those few things and strengthen them. So when I read about this, I, I think of uh, something like the Lutheran Church, um, which is when, when you study the Lutheran Church, when you examine the Lutheran Church, it's dead in religiousness. Um, while proclaiming themselves to be one of the heavy hitters, so to, so to speak, in the Christian landscape, one of the big Protestant denominations, but they're dead. There, there are a few things that we could find in this church that still adhere to the good foundational Christianity, biblical living faith, um, but what can be found should be focused on. Um, perhaps, you know, their proclamation of the Trinity, perhaps their adherence to, to good old hymns. Um, these are certainly good things, but in the midst of a dead church, they're fading. So they're cautioned to be on alert, to watch. An alert and spiritually cautious person will recognize dead religion and will sound a warning or flee. And although the church is dead, there are a few of the Lord's sheep still in there um, who, are, who are alive and stuck in that system. So they're to be on guard and, and to watch out for this dead religion. And, and so that's the caution to us, to, to, to guard ourselves against that, to be on guard against um, just religious, dry, repetitive, vain traditions, things that have no no life in them, no, no spiritual life. They're just fleshly um, processes. You know, kneel now, stand now, repeat this phrase, say this thing, say this prayer, do, you know, whatever it is, it, it has the fragrance of death on it. And we're to be alert and on guard and to watch for that, to guard against that, to hold fast to the good, the, 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 the alive things, the sound doctrine, the, the, the real biblical faith. The, these things are what we're supposed to hold on to. Um, so church number six is the church at Philadelphia. Um, we read about that in Revelation 3, uh, verses 8 through 10. It says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, do lie. Behold, I will make them come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, and to try them that dwell upon the earth. So the lesson here is to persist and boldly pursue open door ministries. Um, this church appears to be a small church. It says they have a little strength, but they have an effective ministry an open door. This church holds fast to their proclamation of faith and does not deny the name of Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, they too are afflicted with these satanic ministers pretending to be Jews, but God will conquer these fakes. Um, so, so this church is encouraged to press on, to continue in their ministry, not fearing the ministers of Satan or their lack of strength. Um, or, their, or their smallness. For God has opened a door and no one can shut it. Um, we're reminded of uh, Job 42.2. I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. And um, let's see here. I had uh, another verse, but it's not pulling up. Um, so we'll just skip it. Isaiah 14.27 for reference. Um, when God opens a door, we have to be bold and courageous to walk through it. When the Lord gives you a ministry, and, and, and in my experience, when the Lord does something, it's smooth. There's no, there's no real effort put into it. Doors just open. 
and you're able to use whatever gifts, whatever talents the Lord has given you um, to glorify him, to magnify his name, to proclaim his name. Uh, whether it's big or small, whatever the ministry is, it's an open door. And we're supposed to use that opportunity to not be afraid to pursue that ministry, um, to not fear the naysayers, to not fear the ministers uh, of Satan, but to, to go through that door, to trust in the Lord and to, and to use that opportunity to proclaim the gospel. And, and so that was the lesson there. And then uh, the final church, um, Laodicea, uh, Revelation three fifteen through 19. Know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the, the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So the lesson that I get from this one here is don't grow complacent. So here, here we find a church that uh, is rich in materialistic goods, having an abundance of worldly riches. And, but this has caused them uh, to fall into the danger that Agur prayed about in uh, Proverbs 30. Uh, we read about that in verses 8 through 9. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest and take the name of my God in vain. So these people have become rich and 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 lose focus of their need of God. Um, this pr prosperity has caused them to fail to see uh, their spiritual wretchedness, supposing that an abundance of wealth is an evidence of blessing, and therefore presuming that they must be doing things right. Um, 1 Timothy 6.5 talks about that uh, when it's talking about these false teachers who, who have a love of money. It says, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyselves. So these would be like your, your TV preachers who, who, who say you're supposed to have an abundant life. You know, and they're talking about materialistic gain. Um, that's not godliness. And this church had fallen for that. They thought because we're rich, because we're doing so well, God must be pleased. We're blessed. Woe unto this church. Their partial separation from the world, um, which would be cold, has caused them to think that they are okay. But their separation from the spirit, which would be the hot, um, has left them in a most miserable spiritual state. Um, two says, um, to show that the spirit is exemplified by the hot. It says, and they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? And uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, quench not the spirit. Quench is to like pour water on a fire. Um, and then uh, Acts 2, verse 3, um, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire and it sat upon each of them. Um, so this church is neither hot nor cold. Um, they're, they're balancing in the middle, one foot in the world, one foot in the church, um, trying, to play the, trying to play both. We're Christians, but we love all the materialistic gain. We love the things of the world. Um, and the Lord says he'll spew them out of his mouth. So God counsels them to buy gold tried in the fire. Um, 1 Peter 1, seven says, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perish, though it be tried with fire, might be found under the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so they're counseled to buy that gold, that gold that's tried in the fire, which comes through the trials of our faith, not through manifold abundances, not through materialistic gain. 
it, it comes through an, uh, uh, a purifying of your faith, an increase of godliness. Um, and, and that comes through trials and tribulations. And, and they're also counseled to be clothed in white raiment, uh, which is uh, talked about in Revelation 7, 14. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are the they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Um, so that, that, that white raiment comes through the blood of the Lamb. So they're told, uh, seek real riches, real, real good clothing, which comes through the blood of Jesus Christ, through faith in him, and through a trying of your faith, through through a perfection of your faith, through spiritual spiritual matur maturity. Um, so the caution here is to not seek fleshly comforts, uh, which will lead to complacency and, and spiritual death, but to seek holiness. Um, like the saying goes, God is more interested in our holiness than in our comfort. So the seven lessons we got here to reiterate um, from church number one, don't forget to share the gospel. In all our study and in all, in all our wisdom that God gives us, in all our, our intellect, those of us who are drawn to that sort of thing, those who love intellectual study, we can't forget to share the gospel. We can't forget um, where we fell from, how we were damned and lost and have been saved by the faith and grace of Jesus Christ, and we must share that with others. So don't forget to share the gospel. And number two, endure hardships and persecutions. We're called um, to, to a life of persecution. All who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Don't grow dis disheartened. Um, don't, don't, don't grow disillusioned that, that you might lose your, your, your job or your wealth or your home or your family or your friends. These things are going to happen to Christians. Rejoice that you have an eternal treasure. You have heavenly treasures that are, that are so much more than anything that this world has to offer. Endure. Set your eyes on Christ and on heaven. Whatever happens in this world, let it come and go. We're gaining more. Um, so endure the hardships and persecutions. Uh, lesson number three is don't passively tolerate false teaching. Don't say, uh, I'm content. You know, I, I believe sound doctrine. I got this figured out. Let other people believe. You know, if they want to deny the Trinity, if they want to do all this other nonsense, you know, whatever, who, who am I to say anything? No, we have to combat that. Part of, of living the truth, uh, having sound doctrine, is, is, is defending the faith, is presenting the truth in opposition to the false. We have to be um, diligent and vigorous in defending the faith and, and shutting down the false, protecting the ears of other people from these false teachings. We have to speak out against them, even calling people out by name. Um, lesson number four is we have to guard against seduction. Um, we can't be lured into thinking, you know, that, that it's, uh, we, we can, we can just let these false teachings in the, the allurements of Jezebel to come in and, and is like, Hey, we're doing all these good deeds we're, we're we have a loving heart. Um, so it don't matter what's being taught and, and that seductive spirit that's so prevalent in the charismatic church, you know, we have to resist that. And then the fifth lesson is uh, the warning against dead religiosity, um, to not just go through traditional um, habit, thinking that, that somehow just by doing these religious deeds, we're somehow pleasing to God. It's dead. There's no sincerity in it. There's no, there's no worship in it. There's no purity in it. It's just vain repetitions, and we have to, we have to resist those and be on guard against those. And then uh, number six is to persist and boldly pursue open door ministries. When the Lord gives you an open door, when he when he presents an opportunity for you to use your gifts and talents to magnify his name, to edify others, um, to teach others about Jesus Christ, go through that door. Even if it's a small ministry, there are no small ministries. If the Lord uses you to lead one person to salvation, uh, think about the, the eternal joy that that creates. Um, and, and so boldly pursue those. Don't worry about the naysayers. Don't worry about the false, false teachers. Pursue your, your ministry. And then the last one is don't grow complacent. If, and, and that's 
important in America, especially where we have an abundance, we can't let those things get a hold of us. Where we think that because we have an abundance of food and comfort, that somehow we're blessed and favored by the Lord. Those things blind us. And, and we cling to those so much, we put our faith in them that when they go away, we're despondent. We have to put our faith in Christ. Whether he gives riches or poverty, it doesn't matter. Our hope is in Christ. We have to keep our eyes on him. We can't get complacent in, in materialistic gain. And uh, so th those are the seven lessons that I took away from the, the seven churches at Revelation. Um, as always, if, if you're just catching the end of this, you couldn't watch the whole thing, um, subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can watch this and all my videos at your convenience. It's King Ram 417 That's K, my middle initial, Ingram, my last name, 417. And uh, Lord willing, I'll get this posted on here, or on there right away. All right, thanks for watching, guys. I love you, and I'll talk to you next time.